Hello everyone. Today we're going to discuss Chapter 7 of the Easy Builder Pro User Manual. In this video, we'll demonstrate the basic steps necessary to access and use our event log. After this, we'll discuss how to monitor these events within your project, as well as how to configure push notifications to allow remote monitoring. Let's get started by opening an instance of Easy Builder Pro. During today's demonstration, I'll be using a CMT, however many of the functions and features that we'll demonstrate are accessible within other HMI projects as well. With our project open, let's go ahead and select our data slash history tab, which is located on the top of our application towards the left hand side. Directly underneath our data slash history tab is our event alarm section. When we add an alarm or attempt to monitor an event within our project, we'll do so by adding an event within our event log. Let's go ahead and open our event log and get an overview of our configuration. At the top, we have our category dropdown list. Alarm categories can be used to organize your events and can also be specified within our event and alarm objects. To the right of our drop-down list, we can name our event categories. And just underneath, we have a checkbox to enable our HMI's backlight when an alarm occurs. Towards the center, our now gray empty field is where our list of events will populate. We can add and monitor up to 10,000 different events within Easy Builder Pro. As with many items in Easy Builder Pro, we can also define a control address. When not configured to send data to an external device, the control address serves but a single purpose, to clear the event log on the HMI. However, if we enable history files and select a directory other than the HMI, or configure the HMI to record data until the space is full, you'll notice our control commands which are displayed under our control address, change accordingly. Let's select our USB disk and configure our control address to LW2 in this example. Also, as you may have noticed, selecting an external storage device will display a new checkbox, allowing us to add a status and error register. This can help us monitor our data transfer. And I'd like to note that had I configured a MySQL or MS SQL database within my project, I'd also be able to sync our event information to our SQL database. Just above our New button, our Preservation Limit will allow us to specify the maximum number of files preserved in HMI memory. This number does not include the file generated on the current day. While an external storage device is selected, we can also configure our HMI to sync data automatically on a user-defined interval. Next, I'd like to briefly explain the different functions that will help us build our event log. Our New button will allow us to add a new event, while our Insert button will allow us to add an event within a configured sequence of events. We can also copy paste, or delete events within our log, or even use our paste add mode button to quickly add multiple events within our log. And although the settings button will allow you to access and change the settings of an existing log, you don't necessarily need to use this button as double clicking on an event will allow you to change the settings as well. Directly to the right, we also have our import and export buttons. These buttons can be used to export your existing event log in XLS format or import an event log from another project. And you may have noticed the small green X in the top right corner. This button will generate an example of an event log within an Excel spreadsheet. This example can then be modified and can be used to help build your event log entirely within Excel. With that information covered, let's move forward and create our first event log. To do this, I'm going to select New, 
and our Event Settings menu will appear. At the top of our Alarms configuration, we can assign it to a specific category. As I explained before, Alarm categories can be used to help organize our event log or allow us to configure a display object to show only certain alarms from specific categories. Underneath this, I can configure the priority of our alarm. The priority of an alarm will allow us to establish the order in which events are sent as push notifications, how they are sorted within our alarm bar or alarm display object, and even allow an alarm with an emergency priority level to display a small notification in CMT Viewer when viewing multiple projects simultaneously. Now, in some applications, an initial start sequence may trigger a false alarm. In order to resolve this issue, Wintech has added an option to delay event monitoring for a pre-configured amount of time. And by default, this is set to one second. We'll configure our current alarm to save historical log data by selecting Save to History. And we can also enable the push notification checkbox, which will generate an event visible within our Easy Access 2.0 application. But this feature isn't necessary for our project. Now, we'll need to specify if this event will be reading a word or bit value as this will change the conditions available for selection. Just to get an idea of what conditions we can monitor, let's first select a bit value. Within our condition section, you'll notice that we can monitor four different conditions related to a particular bit state, which include either when the bit is in the on or off state, or during a specific state change. Although for this example, we're going to read a word value. And within our read address, you'll notice that our alarm is configured to read our internal register LW0. Currently, we have our data type set to 16-bit unsigned. To change this, we'll select the settings button on the right-hand side and configure the data type within our drop-down list. Near the center of our general tab, we can enable a notification bit. And of course, on the bottom, we can also specify our condition. Like many objects and settings within EasyBuilder Pro, our events condition can be dynamic. We have six different condition operators. These operators are also used within our macro workspace and represent less than, greater than, equal to, not equal to, less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to. The condition value itself can also be changed dynamically from any predefined register. In this example, we'll set our condition to greater than, and we'll give our event a dynamic condition value, which will be read from the next consecutive register after our read address. The only way we can change this to a separate predefined register is if we check read and condition use different addresses. Next, we'll select our Message tab and configure the event's content. At the top, we can configure the wording of our message. And if within your project, you've predefined a label or string library, you can also specify this here. And on that note, I'd like to mention that while using either the string or label library, the alarm can have a dynamic message that will change depending on the language or state configured. And for educational purposes, let's go ahead and create a string section within our string library. To access our string library, we'll select the Project tab and select String within the Library section on the right-hand side. I'm going to select New Section and give this section a name. I'll call this fault code. Now I've been asked several times if there is a way to have an alarms message depend on the value within its read address. 
Well, using the string library, we can define a section of the dynamic entries. I will label them alphabetically so that we can monitor the state change in real time. I'll leave state 0 blank in this example, and I'll create a total of five states. With our string library complete, let's exit our library and open our alarm. Now in our message tab, you'll see that our string library section is no longer grayed out. And so we'll enable this. And now within our string ID section, I can select a specific string from within my created section or define a dynamic string entry. I'm going to enable dynamic for this example and configure our dynamic address so that it targets our alarm's read address. So essentially, this alarm will be triggered if the read address, which is LW0, is greater than our condition value, which is specified within LW1. And the message's content will be displayed if the value within our dynamic string register corresponds with a row number within our fault codes string section. The dynamic string register is also our alarm's read address, meaning that as the alarm's value changes, the message's content will as well. And that description may have been a little confusing, but it should make more sense when we run a simulation. In the center, we can modify our alarm's appearance by changing the font color or by giving our alarm a background color. Let's select a red background color for this example. The font in use can be modified within the language and font settings. And this menu can be accessed from the left hand side of the project tab. An alarm's acknowledge value is used within an alarm or event display object's acknowledge register. The acknowledge value corresponds to a window that will be used to display a message. For example, if I leave 11 as my acknowledge value, and I use an indirect window with my alarm object, and the register used within the indirect window is also my acknowledge register, then window 11 can be used to display helpful information related to this alarm. During this demonstration, we'll use window 11 to display alarm information so let's leave our acknowledge value at its default setting. Alarms can also utilize an HMI speaker to emit sound. By default, the beep sound is selected. However, some HMIs are equipped with a mono speaker which can play custom sounds as well. The last feature on this page is our multi-watch function. Multi-watch allows you to create a dynamic message by reading and displaying data from a user-defined list of registers within your alarm's message. This is done by adding the multi-watch syntax to our alarm's message. The syntax can be found by clicking the blue syntax button. Let's define a new watch address within our multi-watch list by selecting the drop-down menu and clicking 1. Now we'll click our settings button and I'll configure my watch address to be LW1. If you recall, LW1 is used as the alarm's dynamic condition value. With our watch address defined, let's copy our syntax for a signed decimal integer. Within this syntax, the pound sign should be replaced with the number that corresponds with your watch address. The letter after the parentheses determines the data type of your watch address. And the asterisk can be replaced with a number that specifies the number of digits after the decimal point when reading numeric data. Since the value we're going to read is a whole number and the number of digits after the decimal point is zero, we can ignore the asterisk.
since our message content is defined within our string table, we'll paste our syntax within each label. And I'll change the pound sign to the number that corresponds with our watch address, which in this case is 1. And with that configured, we'll click OK and close our string table. With our message's content complete, let's take a look at how to send this message as an email by configuring a SMTP server within your project. To begin, I'm going to click OK and close our alarms settings menu. And we'll open our system parameters, select the email tab, enable the email function, and configure our SMTP settings. I'm going to be using a Google SMTP server in this example. And with my SMTP settings configured, I'm going to add myself as a recipient into Group A. And before we exit, let's test our SMTP settings. And with our settings properly configured, We'll head back to our Events Settings menu and enable an email push notification. Our alarm will send an email when the event is triggered. We'll send this email to Group A. And I'll configure the HMI to attach a screenshot of our display as well. Next, let's select the last tab and configure alarm statistics. There are several system registers that you can use to monitor alarm statistics within your project. If we enable the occurrence read and reset address, then the address configured will display how many times this alarm has been triggered since project boot. Our elapsed time read and reset address will monitor how long this alarm has been active within your project in seconds. And as stated, both of these addresses can be read and written to. This will allow you to reset the occurrence count or time stated. Now, below we have some system registers that are built in. This includes a series of bits that can be used to detect when an alarm in a specific category is active. System register LW11499 will display the total number of alarms currently active, and a series of registers that will display how many alarms are active within a specific category. For now, Let's configure our elapsed time address to LW3, and we'll also use LW11499 within our project as well. I'll go ahead and close our alarm settings menu, and we'll create the objects associated with our alarm. Let's start by creating our numeric objects. So far, we've used LW0 through LW3. So we'll select the numeric object from within the object tab. I'll leave this configured to LW0 and place this on our work area. We'll then use the multi copy tool to create the other objects. For demonstration purposes, I'm going to label these objects using a static text object. And 
with that configured, let's create our LW11499 numeric object as well. And now we'll select the data slash history tab and choose a display object for our alarm. The alarm bar is used to display a scrolling banner that lists active alarms. The alarm display object is a table that will display rows of active alarms and use columns to display alarm information. The event display object will show active, acknowledged, and resolved alarms within your project. And the event bar chart which is exclusive to our CMT and CMTX series, will display event information as a horizontal bar chart. For this demonstration, we'll use an alarm display object, and within our general tab, we'll configure the acknowledge address to LW4. And this address will correspond with the address for our indirect window, which we'll create in a minute. Switching to the Alarm tab, I'd like to point out that you can restrict what alarms an object will display by defining the categories. Since our alarm is in category 0, and this object will display category 0 through 255, our alarm's content will display within this object. I'll also give our alarm a caption. I'll call this Active Alarms. Switching to our Sort tab, we can modify and configure the data columns that the object will display, although I'll leave mine at default, which will display the trigger time and message. And with that configured, let's click OK and close our object. And we'll create our indirect window. To do this, we'll select the Object tab and select the Embedded window. Within the drop-down list, I'll click Indirect Window. I'll configure our read address to LW4, and we'll select the Position tab and enable Auto-Adjust Windows Size. Let's leave the rest of our settings at default and place our object. Next, let's create a new window on Window 11. We'll rename this window to Warning. And I'll change this window's size so that it's a bit smaller than my home page. And the color so that it stands out. and we'll click OK. Now I'll open our warning window and add a text object to create our warning. I'll just put Please Clear System Fault. And I'll use a set word object to close this window it will be addressed to address LW4 and submit a constant value of 0. Alright, with our demo properly configured, let's run an offline simulation. With our simulation running, let's configure our dynamic condition value. I'll set this to 2, and next, let's trigger our alarm, because our alarm's condition states that it must be larger than the condition value. We'll set our read address to 3, and you'll see that our alarm's message shows C2. I'll change our read address to 4, and the message changes to D2. This occurs because our string table determines what label is shown based on the value entered within our read address. 
It also uses the multi-watch syntax to display the number entered within our alarms condition value. This is kind of an odd configuration, but is only for demonstration purposes. While our alarm is triggered, you'll notice that our elapsed time has been steadily increasing. Although this value can be cleared at any point, it is a convenient way to monitor how long an alarm has been left active within your project. Our system register will show us how many alarms are active within our project. Right now we have only one alarm within our project, so this object can only display a maximum of one. Selecting our alarm will display our warning message, which states, Please clear system fault. And we'll use our set word and close this warning. Now you may have noticed that I received an email when my alarm was triggered. Let's take a look at what our notification looks like. I haven't defined anything fancy, but we can clearly see our alarms message and an image of our display. Now, let's clear our alarm and use our control address to sync our data to our USB. To do this, I'm going to submit a value of 2 into our control register. Within the EasyBuilder Pro installation directory, we can look through the contents of our USB and we'll find our event information in the form of a DB file. Using Easy Converter, an application accessible within our Utility Manager, I'll open this file and convert this to an Excel sheet. where we can then view our stored data. And with that said, I hope you've learned a lot during this in-depth introduction to Chapter 7. And as always, if you found this tutorial helpful and would like to see more, head on over to our YouTube channel and select the Playlist tab. Feel free to check out our website as well for free demo projects, user manuals, and more. Thank you for watching.